Welcome to another episode of the Drug Classroom Podcast. Today I spoke with Julian Buchanan. He's a former professor and probation officer. Throughout his life, he's been focused on harm reduction, and especially over time, he has worked to spread accurate information about drugs and point out the ways in which prohibition is actually the main driver of many of the harms that people associate with drugs. He's published papers on the topic of prohibition. During his life, he's worked at Liverpool University and Victoria University of Wellington among other universities. He also worked as a consultant and independent expert for the UNODC, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. During this episode, we discussed the source of prohibition, the role of race and fear, factors that have perpetuated the drug war, and the way things are currently changing. As always, everything the Drug Classroom does, including this podcast, is exclusively supported by Patreon and other sources of donations. So if you want to help out, I really encourage checking out Patreon at patreon.com slash the drug classroom. You can also help out by leaving reviews on iTunes. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me at seth at the drug classroom.com. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. I'm here with Julian Buchanan. Julian, welcome to the podcast. Cheers. Good to be here. So before we get into discussing prohibition and drug policy, can you just give a little background on yourself and how you got into the field? Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got into the field uh, by way of being a qualified social worker, and uh, that was the qualification you had to do to become a probation officer, and I was a probation officer in uh, Merseyside in the 1980s, and... uh, In the 1980s, there was a a major, what they called a heroin epidemic, and it was particularly bad in in, uh, working-class, deindustrialized cities. So where I worked was was in Liverpool, and uh, that was hit really badly with lots of closures of shipyards and factories and uh, lots of unemployment. And all of a sudden, loads of the young people there started using heroin and uh, there was a major uh, problem with heroin and the, there had never really been uh, a, a mass working class use of, of drugs like like uh, heroin in that time and uh, they wanted to uh, clean up and resolve and save people and I joined in on that as a probation officer uh, but I soon realised that that wasn't, uh, that wasn't working really so uh, that's how I then started looking at drugs differently, and uh, they appointed me as a drug specialist in 1986, 85, I think it was, and uh, I then started looking at alternative ways of engaging with the problem. So there's a discussion there about abstinence and harm reduction, but uh, but it was that sort of baptism uh, into the problem that really immersed me in, in the whole drug scene, and uh, really since then, I've carried on uh, continuing to 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 battle and sadly in some respects some of the issues and the the revelations and the work we did in the early mid 1980s and and, uh, late 80s are still just as relevant today because in some respects little has changed so i moved into academia and became an academic uh after maybe it's about 1995 96 uh, and I've worked at different universities uh, in England and Wales and then more latterly uh, finished my academic career uh, at uh, Victoria University in New Zealand. So all that work is at university. I've been doing research and writing uh, in respect of, of drug policy. What was it about the the situation that you initially encountered when you were working that made you feel like the way you were addressing the problem or other people were was not really going to be a solution to the issue of drug use and the effects on society? Sure, yeah. It was because the dominant approach uh, and the perceived wisdom at that time was abstinence. It was that we, that it was that the young people, you know, when I say young people, they'd be largely sort of fifteen to uh, late twenties, that they had developed a heroin problem and that they were going to die, and that was the perceived uh, understanding that that we needed to get people detoxed and we need to get people uh, drug free uh, 
And that, I, I, I was involved with that. Uh, I, I was keen to, to do something positive and help. So as a probation officer, when people committed crime, I was persuading them to become drug-free. Uh, then I'd be uh, taking them to detox in Merseyside. Then I'd be driving them down to rehabs, to Phoenix House, to Inwood House, to Chatterton Hay. These are all different rehabs across uh, England. Uh, but they'd soon be back, and uh, it was doing them no good. In fact, if anything, it was doing them a lot of harm because people were people were being coerced to say things that they didn't really. They, they, I would say they were neither ready, able, or wanting to become drug free. But that was the only option for them, and. Uh, and once I pressurised them, as most people did, uh, they then have to tell a lie. So that you then put put people under pressure to live a lie, and and then you raise the expectations of the court that they're going to become drug free. You raise the expectations of the family and friends that they're going to be cured, uh, but they're not ready to for that step. Uh, maybe they don't even want that step. But in setting them up to fail, you've actually damaged them. You've damaged their opportunities. You've damaged the the position within the court. You've made it more likely that they'll go to prison. And you've offered them a type of treatment that, that, that wasn't suitable and, and they weren't ready for. So so really, it was a, a painful lesson in, in being part of the problem and, and realising... But also realising that a lot of this stuff about drugs wasn't true, that, pe- that, that heroin actually isn't damaging for the body. Uh, you know, at that time I had women on probation who were using heroin, and there was talk that they're going to damage their babies, and if they go on methadone, methadone would lead to deformed babies. You know, that, that if you keep taking heroin, eventually it kills you. And all, I realised as well that these, these so-called... Uh, truths were, were, were not were not authentic. That they, they were not real. They, they were they were misinformation and propaganda. So it was quite a uh, quite a shock really at that time. And that's when I started moving into looking at the whole situation differently. Uh, and I think that one of the training events I went to was in psychology and looking at at addiction more in terms of habitual behaviour. But then obviously the AIDS issue kicked in, so we started changing then towards harm reduction. So that's what really uh, led to the desire to, to want to do things differently. It seems there are multiple things nowadays that continue to contribute to focusing on abstinence and, and a prohibition model, but there's also a lot of talk about the the origins being fear-based and racism-based. And what do you think is the, even if it's not the cause now, what do you think is the actual source of this kind of prohibition policy? Because obviously, if you go back a century, we weren't actually in the situation. It's not always been no. prohibition model so how do you think we actually got into this this kind of policy yeah the, the, the policy doesn't make any sense it's not rational uh, it's not based on science uh, it's it's not you know prohibition is not based about protecting people it's not based around reducing drug use or reducing drug supply we unfortunately keep mapping and comparing and measuring prohibition against those measurements but they're not in my view the the reason or the aim of prohibition i think prohibition is essentially about protecting vested interest and protecting uh, white lifestyles and privilege uh, so prohibition is really about the alcohol and tobacco industries protecting their own industries and to some extent the the caffeine industry but but less so but they're all three recreational drugs which can cause problems and all can also lead to death Uh, so for me prohibition is about well these are the drugs that we do and uh, we don't want the drugs that you do uh, for partly to protect the the industry but also it's the fear of the other so it's a it's got racist uh motivations behind it because 
the Chinese would lie down to smoke their opium. Uh, so lying down to smoke your opium on a, through a pipe is, is culturally not the way we do drugs. And then, you know, it's, some people would be smoking cannabis, whatever. That's not what we do. And, and, and all this uh, law and, and policy change towards changing uh, and, and maintaining the prohibition uh, position is backed up with propaganda and misinformation, and uh, so 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 for me, it's it's not about it's not about the the the, the drugs that are prohibited are are dangerous. Actually, they're not. I think most of them are much safer than the drugs that we uh, have culturally promoted and and uh, approved. There also seems to be a sort of strange moral position that at least some people take for religious or a variety of other reasons obviously it doesn't make much sense when you consider most people don't have the same position towards alcohol but there does seem to be this this drive towards always viewing any kind of altered state as this sort of inherently nasty bad thing for society so i think it at least seems to me that some people may not be the the primary reason for sort of top down prohibition, but there's some bottom up cultural view against you know you shouldn't be on heroin. That's a inherently a bad thing to even sort of be pursuing that kind of activity. Do you think yeah. that that contributes? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's lots of different threads and you know to, that, that that will make up arguments uh, to support prohibition. And I think they evolve and develop over the years, and sometimes they're, they're, they're fueled by misinformation. But I think, I think it's you know it's it's right to respect a, 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 a religious commitment that might say, well, for me, I don't want to lose control of my body or whatever. I don't want to lose control of my mind. And, and there's people who have that position, and that, that's fair enough for them. So there's another discussion then about whether that's legally right to ever impose that upon others. It might be right for them. But the, the other aspect of, of that argument is that it's, it's a misunderstood perspective because people will, will, the same people will start the day with a cup of coffee to give them a bit of excitement or buzz or energy. Uh, and they don't think anything about it, and, and they will use, uh, you know, different drugs, pharmaceutical drugs, for for, for different reasons, and, and see, or, or they'll, you know, so so people will, or they'll take something to help them relax or to calm down. So the boundaries between uh, being pure and in control of your own mental states and physical states, uh, for some uh, religious reason or, or moral reason. Uh, can be respected, but I, I'm not sure that people have really thought through uh, w where that takes you ultimately, and, and, and when those boundaries are, are being crossed, because I think they can be crossed in, in all sorts of ways in an everyday sense. So I think, so I think even with that group of people and that perspective, they still have an over exaggerated uh, view towards the illicit substances. And one of the things I always find interesting is people have in many ways a reasonable view about alcohol they are able to realize the drug has effects that are different at a glass of wine with dinner or are different at a a normal party or social setting but then there's also alcohol addiction and excessive use and they don't group all of the problems associated with excess with the drug itself because they know they themselves or other people can use it safely and there's just no consideration that that could actually apply to everything from heroin to methamphetamine to any other drug and it seems like that kind of you know every time i have a discussion with people who are in favor of prohibition that seems to be the stance there's just this feeling that among people that whatever is the worst possible scenario of heroin use sort of a somebody without a home who steals to support their habit is exactly what you would see under legalization because it's inherent in the drug, which is sort of a amusing position because it's not as though heroin is actually more impairing for your inhibition than alcohol. If anything, it might actually not even be as severe. So I guess probably there's no specific reason people have this view. They just don't even think about it too often. But I've noticed it's a very common perspective. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's a good point. But I think there is a reason, really. I think the reason is because of 
the forces of prohibition. You know, prohibition isn't a, a rational position. It's it's ideologically based, and uh, that ideology, in my view, is is found the foundation of it is not dissimilar to sexism or racism or homophobia. Uh, it's it's rooted in prejudice and misinformation and propaganda, and so it's not surprising that people don't feel able to talk uh, sensibly or rationally about methamphetamine or heroin or crack cocaine, uh, and and they do feel able to talk sensibly about alcohol because their perception of alcohol isn't as tainted and distorted uh, by the by the stereotypes, by the misinformation, and it's pretty, it's pretty uh, all pervasive and relentless. Uh, the the levels of, of misinformation which are, are being drip fed permanently uh, to the population, so that when they think of 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 methamphetamine or when they think of heroin, they think of the worst case scenarios. And as you say, that then that that three percent. And I think it's you know roughly sort of three to seven percent of any substance will lead to problems uh, for three to seven percent of the population. But they see that as being what all people who use crack cocaine or, or, or ice or whatever uh, look like. So it's it's distorted. But like you suggest, I do believe that that anybody that any drug can be used recreationally, that, that, it, that the real issue is to do with the, the set and the setting, uh, not the substance. So, so you know, we do see people who, as you say, are a complete mess on alcohol, and it is a really damaging drug. Uh, but, but the same would be true for virtually any drug, really. There are some people who develop major problems with almost any drug, you know. So, but it's not so much to do with the drug. Drugs do have certain properties, yes, but it's much more to do with the the, the journey, the background, and the individual and, and their social circumstances. There's also a significant overestimation, it seems, about the connection between drug use and crime. And not that there isn't a connection, but really the factors that seem to be responsible for the connection are not ever really considered. It was it would seem to me that prohibition contributes to a much larger amount of crime, you know, especially if we take it beyond the West and consider the impact of prohibition on South America and Mexico and other regions. And and that's actually a part of the discussion that never seems to get into people's minds too much is this idea that you want to keep people from using drugs for some sort of vague societal benefit is having massive consequences in other places. But the the frequency with which I hear Mexico or or Brazil mentioned in this discussion is is almost non-existent. It's not mm. really, you know, brought up. Why do you think there's such a sort of a general ignorance in the discussion about these other countries? Yeah, well, I think I think the first thing to say is that uh, what what you said is, you know, it, it needs affirming, which is that the, the harm uh, caused by drugs is much greater than the, uh, sorry, the harm caused by prohibition is much greater than the harm caused by drugs. And in relation to criminal activity, you know, it's it's driven largely by prohibition, and uh, not by the substance themselves. So there's a big discussion in that, really. But in re in respect of one of the harms being uh, the and you know the the destabilisation and the the serious violence and, and murders uh, in other countries in the supply trade and. Uh, the the armed forces uh, going in and, and destabilizing. Why isn't this talked about as much? Uh, I, I guess for me, I'm, I suppose I'm disappointed in some respects. I, I, although I shouldn't really be surprised, is that I think the drug reform agenda tends to reflect the individuals leading those movements. And so it so it tends to reflect the the vested interest. So so we don't tend to have the same empathy, and the same uh, interest towards other countries. We tend to look at the people who are like us. And so I think most of the drug reformers, you know, are white middle class people, 
uh, not from those countries. So, so unfortunately, the, the needs of, of uh, often developing countries uh, are not properly represented and, and the empathy and the care isn't there in the same way. And there's actually been some positive change in these areas. It seems as though there's at least some countries, I believe Mexico and perhaps Peru moved towards decriminalization. And part of it was for reasons like like coca and stuff like that that has a cultural connection. But there's also been this this growing movement among people in Central and South America to change the drug laws. And I've heard like the amount I'm aware of that situation, but the amount of information from those areas that actually bleeds into the discussion in the US or England seems to be very minimal, which you would think there would be a greater interest in it because you have an entire sort of entire countries in some cases that seem in favor of reform because they are experiencing a a level of harm from this policy that we don't even consider. Although I'd say even in countries like the US, gang violence is also heavily connected to prohibition. So there is some of that, but also most people do not live in areas that are affected by gangs. So therefore, there's also a disconnection even within your own country. So it seems, I mean, this applies to many areas, but it's sort of a out of sight, out of mind issue and, and nobody's internalizing what this desire to prohibit drugs, you know, does to other people. Even when those people are are in the media screaming at the West saying, you know, please, let's, you know, come to the table and change this. But they're even somewhat restricted because of international drug controls. And I'm not entirely familiar with how international controls impact domestic policy. Are you more uh, familiar with like how the U.N.'s position impacts what countries can do? Uh, No, not really. I mean, uh, basically, uh, countries can do what they like, uh, as as I understand, but the UN will just exert pressure. So I I don't think there's much that the UN can ever do apart from exert pressure. So I think most of the threats to the developing countries comes from the more powerful countries like the US or the UK. Uh, or Europe exerting economic and political pressures on the developing countries. So I think it's it's less to do with what the UN can do or would do, but more to do with the political pressures that might be uh, placed upon countries like Peru or Uruguay or whatever uh, from the big countries. So there can be economic sanctions which could cost them dearly. So I think it's so it, we talk about the UN, but I think it's much more about uh, the, the the US and and other major players within the UN. But uh, and you think? Go ahead. Yeah. You think that desire from the US and other countries to exert that kind of power probably comes from economic interests, from lobbies, whether it's prison guards or or from lobbies for other drugs, alcohol, tobacco. Is that where you think the the pressure is coming from? Yeah, why, why do the US feel so strongly about uh, prohibition? Uh, and why would they want to exert that? Well, I think, I, I guess it's, it's, it's multi-layered, really. And uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, investment in security services and armed forces. Uh, and there's a lot of ability to invade and mobilise sources in other countries under the guise of the drug war. So I think that's that's part of it, you know, military force and invasion and uh, uh, maintaining control. And then I think the other side is, is maintaining the huge uh, industry of alcohol, tobacco and, uh, and caffeine. So, so I think it's it's, and then I think the other side is is that, you know, there is great political uh, benefit in having an enemy, and so you know, countries have always liked to have enemies. So the enemy might be the commies, it might be the terrorists, it might be drugs, it might be the immigrants, uh, and and while countries can have these threatening enemies, then the country can rally together and uh, and gain some sense of of nationalism or patriotism or or unity in in fighting this uh, enemy who threatens their lifestyle. So I think drugs are also part of of that agenda. That that they 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 are, are demonised in a very personalized way as a threat to your children as a threat to your daughters as a threat to your your family your neighborhood 
and we need to rally together to to keep this war going. So so I think they have a lot of political benefit as well. So I think it is a you know it's it's it, it becomes multifaceted after a while. It becomes you know so many different layers to this operating. Yeah. In the West, there does seem to be a, a general positive move towards sort of somewhat nicer policies, but obviously there's sort of evidence against that when it's Trump or or even some elements in the UK. And obviously, if you extend it to other countries, you still have China executing people for being involved in the drug trade or yeah. the Philippines. Where do you think the world stands, and then more specifically the West? Are we are we really moving in a positive direction, or is the the progress a bit too ephemeral and and not really taking hold? I think we are moving in the right direction. So things are getting better in terms of, and I think I think one of the reasons why things are changing is because of social media. You know, here's here am I in New Zealand and. Uh, here are you in the US and we're having a conversation and this will be later published on the web and people will access that uh, from all over the world. And so I think that wasn't available, uh, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, people did not have the access to the internet in the way that they do now. Uh, and there wasn't the, the software and the facilities available to, to disseminate information. So I think, you know, we, we've been talking about the way in which uh, prohibition is rooted in, in racism, propaganda, prejudice, misinformation. Well, now with social media, we're beginning to erode and challenge an awful lot of that uh, flawed position. And the ordinary person who perhaps hasn't got much of an interest in drugs but, but bought in to the, the whole uh, dominant discourse is now in a position where they can think, I'm not too sure about what's going on here. This doesn't make much sense. I've just read this. Or I've just heard that. Or I've just watched this video. So I think people are now gaining a lot more information through social media. So I think that is a, is a major force an opportunity for, for social change because, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, I've been involved for four or five decades, really, since, well, certainly since the 80s in drug policy. And what hasn't, what, what has been very frustrating is the number of inquiries, reviews, committees, meetings, and uh, research, uh, and they hardly ever lead to any significance or real change. Whereas I do think if things come from the bottom up, then they, they, politicians will be forced to change. So I think that's a very encouraging move uh, of late. But I do, I do have concerns about what's happening in terms of reform, because I can't help but think that uh, there's a, a growing momentum to legalise cannabis, which I'm very happy about. But I would want to see prohibition ended, not not one drug picked off at a time, because otherwise, what we're, all we're doing is is inviting cannabis to join the the prohibition table, uh, the top table from the elite drugs that have been approved. You know, so you have the pharmaceuticals and the uh, alcohol, tobacco, uh, caffeine, and perhaps you could say sugar. Uh, sitting at the table now with ca and cannabis joins them and they maintain prohibition against all the other drugs so I, I worry that uh, that we're not actually tackling the roots of the problem which is uh, uh, prohibition and that all we're doing is inviting cannabis to the table and companies will move in and make a lot of money flogging cannabis which is what they've been doing with, with alcohol and uh, tobacco and whatever I've had a similar serious concern about cannabis legalization, obviously, like you, I'm in favor of it. But the the arguments that have been used to to support that kind of policy change, whether it's medical applications, or it being safer than alcohol, or the seemingly benign nature of the drug don't seem to be very helpful when you consider switching to then focusing on 
heroin or methamphetamine because you're going to have a much harder time making those arguments. Whereas if legalization was coming from a desire to improve human rights or improve the state of other countries, source countries, those things have not received too much attention. It's really been on how benign cannabis appears to be. And I wonder if that kind of boxes in legalization advocates because you can't easily make the same arguments for other substances. Even if you can on a technical level, it's going to be harder to convince people you know, we should legalize heroin because it's safer than alcohol. Even if that were the case, it it would still be harder than cannabis to try to make that sort of move. Whereas a human rights perspective, just simply, should the government even be doing this to begin with, would be a very nice argument. But I've I've heard very little of that when it comes to cannabis. So I do wonder if if, uh, it's going to be hard to make the transition to other legalization attempts. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it could actually make it harder, really, in some respects. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think that's right. It, it, it worries me. And I think some reformers who, you know, I know well, uh, I, I, I pursue a human rights argument and, and, and say that we should end prohibition. That's where, that's you know, that my, my perspective is that uh, what what... What you do with your body, what you, how you, what you ingest, is is your choice, and there is no way that it should be against the law, or, or you should be punished, or stigmatized, or incarcerated uh, over your choices about what you consume, and uh, that's that. That goes for any substance that you choose. It's your body, and it's your choice, and that for me uh, should be a basic human right. It's not really enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, published by the UN. But then it's the same UN that also have outlawed these so-called drugs. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the drugs is just a social construct. It's just a, a list of substances. It's, it, there's no basis to those drugs. So, so what's in the UN isn't exactly always uh, good, good sense. But going back to your point about... Uh, the, the prohibition, so trying to dismantle things uh, by way of legalizing cannabis and, and saying that cannabis uh, is is not as harmful as alcohol. I think reformers are are trying to be pragmatic and trying to find uh, leverage and, and ways of managing pragmatically to persuade people to bring about change. I think I think there are people who are doing that for good reasons. Uh, sincerely trying to tr- try to find a niche and an argument, but as you say, it's a flawed argument, and and I I really don't buy into it at all, and it really uh, annoys me because we are shafting ourselves really. It's it's in in my view, I suppose I've I've, I've said elsewhere, it, it's a little bit like trying to fight sexism by saying you know women women might be hopeless bricklayers, but but sexism's wrong. You know, when you start banging into and colluding with, with with the the the, the, the discrimination and, and the flawed uh, understandings that exist, you, you're just you're fueling the problem itself. Uh, so so, worry, but it also worries me that that there will be a, a major movement towards cannabis simply because. Again, it's what a lot of white, middle-class, privileged kids are getting caught up with, uh, the risk of a conviction. And then there's, the, 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 and then there's the, the respectable, needy people who've got medical needs and might benefit from cannabis. Uh, and then you've got the business opportunities. So for me, it's, it's just playing for uh, the easy targets when really... Drug prohibition is damaging the poor, the indigenous, uh, the people of colour. They're the people who are being really shafted and damaged by prohibition. Uh, but but I don't hear I don't hear the calls to alleviate that damage. Um, we're just seeing in reform uh, easy targets being picked off to try to dismantle aspects of prohibition which will benefit the white and the privileged. Now, I, I'm all for these uh, changes, but I'm bothered about where they'll leave us, and I'm irritated and bothered 
the, the, the same energy isn't there for, for the poor, for, for the, the indigenous and the people of color. When people do actually go beyond cannabis and bring up other drugs, it's almost always in the, the context of Portugal and decriminalization and an increase in the amount of funding for uh, drug treatment and things of that sort. Do you think, because I have some concerns about that as well, but what are your thoughts on focusing on Portugal and, and decriminalization overall? Because it, it still seems like a partial step and it seems as though there's a risk of getting complacent and ending up with some form of decriminalization that doesn't go far enough but is acceptable enough it appears to you know the average person that there would be no push to go further and actually get rid of prohibition yeah i think decriminalization is a is a a good step to towards where we want to be uh so, so that's good news, I think, to decriminalise possession of all drugs. I, I would make sure that we also decriminalise uh, gr- growing and producing drugs for personal use as well. So I think that, that there are two things that should go hand in hand. But decriminalisation, as you say, isn't enough. Uh, and decriminalisation can sound a good thing, but it can be... Uh, administered in a way that continues to be racist and continues to target the poor. So so decriminalisation in, in one sense is a, is a good first step, but it might not be administered in, in a way that's fair and honest anyway. And then the Portugal method, uh, and I hear a lot of people talking about treatments, and that bothers me as well because people are wanting to treat people uh, who either use illicit substances or have a perceived illicit substance disorder. And uh, I, I worry about the assessment of what is a, 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 a disorder, and I worry about the sort of treatments that they might be giving people. Uh, so I think, that, again, there's a whole pile of business interest in in the whole treatment and monitoring of so-called addicts or people with a a substance disorder Uh, so so, so you you, there's no you're not out the you're not out the woods you we're not we still got masses of issues to deal with uh, when we tread you know into decriminalization and beyond and yeah we we need to completely legalize Uh, personal possession and uh, growth and cultivation of all drugs for personal use. That's one thing that has always really stood out to me is it sounds like a great slogan treating drug use as a medical issue, not a a criminal issue, but it still has this impact of elevating drug use to this level of always being an undesirable or dangerous thing. And so you end up with a situation where you are medicalizing and in some ways stigmatizing all aspects of drug use, even though there, as we were saying earlier, there are tons of people for whom this is simply a recreational activity, and they it would not actually actually be ideal for them to be you know bugged by the state and pushed into treatment. They're simply using drugs in their home, and they're not causing anybody any trouble. And yet, this is actually a supposedly nice, good, respectable slogan and call from drug reformers. And I can see where it's coming from, but it's sort of whenever people are elevated drugs in that way and giving them so much power it always it always worries me about how that impacts the general view of drugs yes yes it instead of telling it as it really is uh, we end up uh, perpetuating a lot of the myths that that, that have been under prohibition uh, only to replace it with prohibition too so I don't feel comfortable and in some respects I think Drug use as a health issue can be more dangerous and more damaging to society uh, in terms of of people losing privileges and people uh, suffering uh, than compared to drug use as a crime issue. Because with a crime issue, you can be incarcerated or whatever, but you know there's an end. But once you get to a health issue... You can then be detained under some section. You know, here in New Zealand, we've just uh, introduced a, a compulsory assessment and compulsory treatment of addiction uh, act, so that people can be, you know, assessed and, and removed to be forcibly treated uh, f- for their own good. 
Well, you, once you're on those sort of orders, uh, it's, it can be quite hard to know when those orders come to an end. And, and I don't see drug use as a health issue at all. I've just had a coffee. Had, in fact, I had two coffees this morning uh, just before we, we, we chatted. Uh, I didn't see that as a health issue. You know, taking drugs is not a health issue. Uh, for drug use, when it gets out of control or when it, gets, uh, it, it has adverse consequences to your life, could be a health issue. It could be a social issue. You know, it could, it, but it's not per se a health issue. So if we construct drugs as a health issue, it worries me. But I also think that the that the Nixon war on drugs and the criminal justice approach to drugs has been found out, and I think it's taken it's 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 had its run, it's had its day, it's come to an end, and I think what we what we're seeing is the rehashing of prohibition too, under the guise of drug use as a health issue and a lot of people are buying into it because they think it's the end of 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 the drugs crime and, and it is in one sense but it's it's the launch of a of a new uh re, repackaged part of prohibition which will then see people you know i think in the u.s i've read that there's talk about taking over some prisons and turning them into, you know, abstinence-based rehabs and, and people being then sent to, to these rehabs and stuff. And, and if we're not careful, we'll just end up with uh, the, the same old individuals, i.e. the poor, the people of colour, the indigenous uh, ethnic groups. They will then be rounded up and they'll be processed, drug tested, that they'll be given uh, compulsory treatments and if they fail those treatments, then there'll be punishments, or whatever. And and it's all under the guise that they've got a health problem. So so I think we we're going to be quite worried about uh, going down the road and saying that that drugs is a health issue. Even if it was a health issue, it would be a very strange way to treat a health issue. It would be like I mean, even if even if every case of drug use was representative of some sort of psychological disturbance, it would be akin to going around and, and rounding up people with depression or anxiety or even psychotic disorders, even if they've done nothing wrong to other people and saying for their own good, clearly they're suffering. So out of a sort of act of compassion, we're going to force them into some kind of treatment. And this has happened throughout history, um, but it seems to come from when you're both viewing it as a health issue, but also still stigmatizing and viewing the person who is engaging in the activity as the other. And there's been so little so little interest in hearing from drug users. It's been still a very sort of top-down view, even from reform people, to just sort of analyze people who use drugs and figure out what's best for them. And it's kind of this, you know, it can sound good at times, especially when you compare it to being locked up or something for a long period. But if you really think about it, it's like, well, this is somebody else's life. I shouldn't really be interfering in that way. Should probably find out what they want and then help them with it yeah yeah the, the lack of involvement and, and i think i get most uh, sanity and, and and rationality in in discussion about drug reform uh, from the drug using uh, organizations you know that the, the people uh, who inject or use drugs the pwud groups whatever internationally and nationally they they often speak with a lot more sense on the issue and but they're not included and you know they're they're the users uh and you know for myself i've never ever used an illicit drug uh so i, I come at this whole issue from uh, a personal professional you know having worked in the field and uh, having seen the damage but the but the users themselves are, are, are so poorly listened to and represented, and, and certainly the research I did, you know, has been often uh, through listening and, and representing and giving a voice, you know, qualitative research to to drug users themselves because I think they're the people we need to gain our perspective from. You know, our, our views need to be informed by their lived experience, uh, but I don't think they're that they're. they're prominent enough really yeah but when you say like oh pe people having a health problem and they're being processed by by the system i i, I think the uh, people who've got eating disorders and people who are obese are the next people who will be subject to similar regimes so i think that's probably the, the easiest or best analogy 
because I think that I think there'd be a growing stigmatization of those people, and then there'd be a move towards more compulsory health treatment for those people. But it doesn't deal with the problem uh, in terms of it, we say now drugs is a health issue, and uh, we, we we then settle say in five years' time nobody thinks it's a criminal problem or whatever. But we haven't dealt with the fundamental human rights issue and the misinformation about drugs. People are still thinking you know all these crazy ideas like you know crocodile eats your flesh and uh, bath salts make you eat other people's faces or uh, crack turns your babies into retarded babies and there's all this mad information which is untrue and unfounded and we're, we're not dealing with any of that we're just now saying drugs are a health issue but we carry on with the same uh, ignorant perspectives and uh and, and really, prohibition continues. Uh, and really, we we need to be challenging and ending uh, this this awful regime, which is. I I say that we haven't got a drug. We haven't got a global drugs problem. We've got a global drug policy problem, and that's what's causing the damage, and that's what we need to deal with. And you can see that issue show up as the cause of, of pretty much anything associated with drugs. You were bringing up bath salts or, or cathinones and crocodile and things like that, and so rarely did I hear about the actual cause of those things being ultimately prohibition. I mean, when it came to crocodile, it had to do with prohibiting codeine, and then it pushed people away from codeine and to heroin, but heroin was expensive and harder to get, so they went to terribly made desomorphine, which turned out to just be terrible for you, but it had nothing to do with the drug. I mean, nobody under legalization would choose that kind of a mixture, but nobody ever actually realized that, or cathinones, you know, arising out of prohibiting cocaine and amphetamine and, and MDMA. And that was never really even discussed, although actually one of the few places that seemed to was New Zealand. There was sort of, I'm not I'm not fully familiar with the policy, but wasn't there sort of a, a move to change novel psychoactive substances policy to sort of allow some onto the market? Yeah, there was. Yeah, yeah, there was. Uh, and that's an interesting discussion, really. Uh, yeah, we... we we had the Psychoactive Substances Act uh, of 2013, and uh, it depends on which way you see this, really. You can see it as a very progressive mood, move towards regulation. And uh, what, what this previously what's happened in most countries is that every time a new drug comes on the market, it, it gets eventually added to the Misuse of Drugs Act and becomes banned a banned substance. So... Unless it's on the list, it's not a banned substance. So they had to go through the process of adding the drug to the list so it becomes banned. Not that banning ever achieves anything. Drug use carries on just the same uh, whether a drug is banned or not banned. But, but the politicians uh, masquerade as if we're doing something positive by banning a drug. Uh, so it becomes a lengthy process. And once a drug is banned, then the the chemists tweak the, the drug and then its chemical structures change slightly and then that then is no longer the banned drug because it's a different drug. So it becomes an endless cat and mouse game and uh, the New Zealand uh, had an idea of regulating uh, these so-called legal highs and that, that's another discussion is all these strange names that we have for drugs you know narcotics hard drugs soft drugs uh, psychedelics legal highs uh, it, and then we have other non-drugs it's all it, it becomes a tortuous uh, map of nonsense really trying to make sense of all these different uh, categories but these legal highs are basically you know chemical drugs manufactured and uh, so this, this, this Psychoactive Substances Act meant that the legal highs which were being sold in corner shops and uh, in, in markets and places, they would all be made illegal in one single act. And, and I think this is, very, this, is, this is a worrying human rights issue because prohibition is, is, is bad news. But what prohibition does is it lists uh, drugs that it's against the law to take. So if it's not on that list, you're free to take what you want to take. Whereas what the Psychoactive Substances Act did is it, is it said every new 
psychoactive drug that's ever dreamt of or that will happen in the future is illegal before it's even invented. And it will only become permissible to use when the New Zealand government approves it, if it approves it. And it will only approve that drug if it's regarded as safe. So that raised all sorts of issues around uh, human rights and uh, raises issues around who defines and what is safe. And in life, what is safe in life? You know, are mobile phones safe? Uh, you know, are, uh, are, is our aspartame safe? Is fructose syrup safe? Who, you know, what, is rock climbing safe? Uh, so, so this this psychoactive substances act created a regulatory regulatory framework which it would approve certain drugs, uh, legal highs, and so it did allow a number of legal highs to stay on the market uh, as being temporarily approved. So reformers were hailing this uh, across the globe as being a very successful model of reform. And so they said, you know, regulation is the way to go. But I was a bit of a lone voice criticising uh, this act because, in my view, uh, it's a deeply uh, flawed and worrying pathway to go down. Because what this does is it was it introduced a new, basically, it, it extended uh, it extended the net of prohibition. So now every psychoactive substance is not only uh, unapproved, it's actually that the, 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 the Psychiatric Substances Act made it uh, a crime, an offence, to possess an unapproved drug. So you can only possess. So it, it would have been better if it, if, if it hadn't criminalised and made it an offence. But they gave powers to the police to, to enter properties uh, without a warrant if they, if they suspected uh, that there was... Uh, manufacturing in, in a factory or whatever or in a building and uh, they, they had new uh, powers to incarcerate people for supply of, of unapproved psychoactive substances so so this for me is not the regulatory way we, we, we should head and interestingly there's just been a conference here in New Zealand and the health minister there Peter Dunn was saying that he, he apparently said that he wanted uh, the cannabis legalisation to be put under the Psychoactive Substances Act. Now, this Psychoactive Substances Act basically sets up a framework whereby the only way a drug can be legally approved is if that drug is manufactured by a private company or by a business or by the state and then sold. So individuals cannot grow or, or produce or sell. They, they need to all purchase their drugs. So that, that model means that if you apply that to cannabis, there, there is a risk. Not necessarily it would happen, but for me the big risk is we have a business model where you can only purchase approved drugs if they are bought from approved manufacturers. So that means that the police can still start raiding and criminalising and arresting people for unapproved uh, drugs. So, so maybe you could, you might be growing cannabis, but that's unapproved. You need to be buy, you need to demonstrate you've got this cannabis from a, a, an approved uh, supplier, a, an approved manufacturer, and that for me is a, you know, is a deeply worrying. All we've done is, you know, we, we've left the door wide open for just the continuation uh, of what we've been suffering with for the last 40, 50 years. So this, this Psychoactive Substances Act uh, has fallen by the wayside in terms of its approval system because the approval system was so stringent and uh, involved uh, animal testing and uh, involved great expense on the company. So initially there was a number of legal high companies who were legally, uh, prior to the act, making uh, legal highs and selling them. Well, they a lot of those companies went along with this act, imagining that there would be a, a, a legal framework to sell their drugs. Well, they, they've all, one of them's gone bankrupt and the guys, the, the director has has fled to, uh, to Asia and... Uh, 
there's no route now available for the approval of, of any drugs uh, because the system's broken, as it were, and all, all psychoactive substances are now illegal and the act isn't working properly. So, But in, in one sense, you know, maybe the act has done a, a marvellous job for prohibition because no longer do they have to then keep adding a new drug. It's a blanket ban for every substance uh, here in New Zealand. And that model was then adopted in the UK with the Psychoactive Substances Act, and I think in Ireland as well. So, so it's, it, it, it was hailed as a wonderful regulatory progressive reform move here in New Zealand, but, but it, it, for me it, it illustrates some of the, the worrying uh, bandwagon uh, excitement that you can get from some drug reformers uh, when they get a taste of some possible reform, they they can lose sight of their critical faculties and, and not realise what we might end up with, and what we've ended up with is is quite a mess, really. As bad as the the Controlled Substances Act or any other similar policy from the '60s or '70s is, that really sounds significantly worse because it moves instead of the government having to actually show here's why it's dangerous and then here's the justification for banning. It's just it's you actually have to show us how it's safe. And as you were saying initially, you know, what would you ever consider safe? I mean, there are entire food items that you probably would not depending on how strict you are, you would not consider safe or you would start banning a bunch of uh, non-drug recreational activities because they're not totally safe. So it's this sort of, you know, weird, weird way of approaching things. And yet it's occurring, as you were saying, in a sort of progressive mindset. So you have people who actually think this actually seems reasonable and seems like a a good effort. And meanwhile, it's in many ways worse than what was happening in in the 1970s, which is, you know, remarkable. Uh, And luckily so far that hasn't happened in in the U.S., um, but what has happened, and that is similar to sort of what was happening, it sounds like, with this policy in New Zealand, is that in some states in the U.S., part of the cannabis legalization was really creating a, a pseudo legalization strategy where it would be people couldn't grow it or they would have to get it from there was one state that even tried to have a list basically of of companies where you would you would have to get your cannabis from which is i don't know how how you could call that legal and really it creates a bunch of opportunity for some kind of corruption and yet still it seems like there's so much pressure to adopt anything that sounds even slightly better but in like the case of that state it it was going to be part of the the state's constitution you know so they would they would take a short-term seeming benefit, no matter how negative the long-term consequences are. And it seems there's so few people who are who are very focused on the ultimate goal, which is the policy itself is not right. And I assume that probably exists in every country because it seems every country has been pursuing some kind of reform that is not actually particularly good. Yeah, that seems like a, a major issue. Yeah, I mean, I think it's about hanging on to your principles and, uh, and, and knowing what the problem is and uh, not accepting some compromise that's going to actually create new long-term problems uh, yeah so I mean I, I was going to say I mean the, the, it would be a little bit like the black population of America you know settling for Jim Crow and, uh, yeah. and thinking that Jim Crow was was better than slavery and uh, you know that that's that's where that's a, a parallel. I think you know we're, with prohibition, we're, people are just going to settle for for some arrangements, but uh, we, we end up with more problems. I was told by some reformers, uh, international reformers, you know, look, this is a step in the right direction, and these are compromises that we might have to make. And, and I just think it's awful. I I, I was so uh, irritated. They said they said we can make changes later, and I, I was saying, well. Have you ever tried to change the Misuse of Drugs Act? The Misuse of Drugs Act has been amended so many times, but always amended towards making it more punitive or adding new drugs. It's never been amended positively uh, to alleviate some of the punitive elements of it. So I think that's the other worrying side, is once you enshrine some of these changes into constitution or into legal 
positions, they become very, very difficult to unravel. One of the last things I want to touch on is assuming we could truly have a legalization or whatever kind of policy, there's a lot of focus from people on creating things like significant taxes or mandatory education or bans on advertising. What do you, from your perspective, what kind of legalization policy would you like to see? Because there's some people who even argue against any kind of lowering the drinking age for alcohol or or banning advertising so but for drugs overall what do you think is a a right position to to take yeah well i think i think for drugs most of the harm has been co- created and caused by the criminal justice system so i think the key thing in drug reform is to free up the individual to be able to possess grow produce consume uh, legally f- for personal use, whatever they choose. I think that's the most vital uh, step that needs to take place, is to, is to free up uh, the people who are being harassed. And, you know, I mean, harassed would be a polite word for some, you know, for, for other people. They're losing their lives, they're being incarcerated, losing loads of, uh, of lifetime opportunities as a result of their criminal conviction or incarceration. So, so it, would, it would be wonderful to, to ensure that that became a complete freedom and a human right. Uh, the other aspects of legalisation uh, would be that I wouldn't want to... Prom- basically, I, you know, in, in my dream world, I, I think that what we've done with alcohol is a complete mess, and I don't think we should be promoting alcohol any drug the way that we promote alcohol the sponsorship and the the cultural accommodation and promotion uh, of any drug like the way we we have with alcohol that it's the it's the drug you know i can go to a conference uh, which might be against drugs and i can speak and then uh, you know or i might launch a book or whatever and then at the end of it you know everybody drinks alcohol and it's like it's like we have a bizarre uh, every every occasion you have, you, you you need to go and celebrate and enjoy alcohol. I, I'm I'm all for people enjoying their drugs, but I think we. So I suppose what, where I'm going with this, and I'm saying that look, we've we've got laws, but we've also got cultures, and we have created a culture. So I think we need to think not just about laws, but our cultural accommodation of certain of the way in which we do drugs. So I'd love to see all drugs available for anybody to use, I, but I'd hate I'd hate to see them heavily advertised and promoted and sponsored, you know, through through films, through uh, through shirts, through you know, TV media that this is what you should be taking. Uh, I mean, drugs can cause people problems, and and they do, but as as we said, most of the problems are caused through prohibition. Uh, but most of the people who have problems with drugs are people who had major problems before they started taking drugs. I think that has to be borne in mind too. So I'd like to I'd like to see drug I'd like to see clean legal supplies of drugs of any drug being available uh, through pharmacies uh, and through other clubs or pubs. But I don't want to see, I don't want to see them peddled as an appropriate. That if if you if it's your eighteenth birthday, your twenty first birthday, if it's your marriage, if it's your baptism, whatever it is, the thing to do is to get hammered with this particular drug. I don't want to see that level of of uh, cultural accommodation. And I'm all for taking drugs. And if people want to get hammered, that's cool and that's fine. That's their choice. I don't have a problem with that. I just have a problem with with these dominant. Uh, mindsets telling people what they should do and what would be suitable and what would be the best way you should do stuff so so yeah there's legal stuff but there's cultural stuff as well but legally i'd like to see everybody uh being able to get a clean legal supply but i'd hate to see that being the only way that you can get drugs i think there should be social clubs you know, so if I want to, if I, if I want to make my own beer, I can make my own beer. If I want to join a society or a little group of people who make beer, I can go and do that with that group of people. We can perhaps swap our our home brews together, and I think that could be the case for any drug. And yeah, we we need good information. People do need access to information, and we just tell people the truth about the risks of drugs. Nobody wants to 
harm themselves. The people who want to harm themselves have, have obviously got, you know, major issues in life. Uh, but but the vast majority of people just don't want to harm themselves and they want sound information and they want to know the risks. And uh, and the, the most dangerous drug really uh, is alcohol. And uh, we've learned to live with that in, in, in a way that despite it being heavily promoted and twisted and distorted and a lack of competition, I'd like to see a... Uh, a legalisation where all drugs, because if we can cope with alcohol, we can cope with any drug. But but we need the we need the sound uh, health information out there, and we need support services, but not to not to so called treat people. Yes, some people will need help, but but we need support services that, that don't stigmatise people, that give sound information, that allow people to check stuff, that allow people access to. Uh, clean needles, allow people access to naloxone, uh, and that when the, if people who develop addiction that they can get help with their addiction. But most people who develop addiction problems grow out of it or move out of it. Most people do. Only a hardcore a minority uh, really struggle. But most of that hardcore minority are people struggling with abuse and damage and disadvantage, disadvantage and isolation. Uh, and they've got major problems, most of those people, uh, are over and above drugs. The cultural factor really does seem to be vital and obviously one of the more difficult aspects to change, because even if you change the policies, you don't necessarily get a good drug-using culture. But we do have, it seems to me, without necessarily a ton of knowledge, that there are, for, say, alcohol, better cultures where alcohol has managed to be more integrated into society, and it's not like the UK or the US where it's sort of binge drinking and this sort of excessive clubs and bars type use, but rather more integrated into social settings and not as much alcohol and not as frequent for that kind of significant use. Um, I'm not sure how you actually get the culture to change because there's a lot of factors that led to people initially using alcohol in better ways. And I don't know if you can sort of in a top down way get people to adjust their using, but it does seem like, you know, that would be ideal for, for other drugs. And also the potential diversification of drug use, because when you think about drugs overall, there are so many settings where people are, are using alcohol or another drug, and it's actually not the ideal safest drug for that setting. And if all drugs were available, you could all, you could potentially picture people planning their drug use in a way that was safer. You know, like there are cases where a benzodiazepine or GHB is actually safer than alcohol, but because the other ones are hard to get, everybody is just at all moments pushed in the direction of alcohol. And it seems like there's a potential opportunity for it to go positive or negative for, you know, when you have access to everything, do you pick and choose in a way that is, is safe? And hopefully people do, but obviously people are concerned the opposite could occur. But it seems there's a, there's a lot of promise because we do have examples of better alcohol using cultures. Do you have any ideas about how you can get that to occur? Is it, I mean, one thing seems to be that families sort of frame alcohol in some countries in a different way. It's sort of by the time you're 16, it's, it's once in a while present at dinner or something. Thing. And it's sort of taught that alcohol is used in that way, not in this excessive party way. Whereas in the US, you know, nobody touches alcohol and then suddenly you're 18 or 21 and you're in college and you're getting completely wasted every weekend versus the more a more reasonable kind of use. But I'm not sure how you get that to actually develop. Well, I think I think you can get it to, to develop. And I think I think the, the example with alcohol is a good one because I think it illustrates how how set and setting uh, influence the impact of drugs so alcohol is worse in the, the US and uh, the UK New Zealand Australia uh, and is better in the Mediterranean countries they, they have a much uh, more reasonable and settled uh, management of alcohol and yet it's the same drug and, and in many respects you know very similar people but 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 the environment and, and the attitude means that the impact of the drug changes quite considerably. So so that illustrates the importance of set and setting. Uh, in terms of how do you get there, I think I think a good example of a cultural change towards drug use is the tobacco industry, not the industry, but the use of tobacco. And I think we've seen over the years quite a shift in, in tobacco use. And I think a lot of that's come through health education, 
uh, through campaigns and through regulation. So I think part of the problem we've had with alcohol has been created by uh, alcohol laws which have prohibited. Uh, so I think here in New Zealand, years ago, they, they had this no drinking, I think it might have been after six o'clock or whatever. Uh, I'm not sure, no, maybe I, that, that wasn't true, but there was, there's a thing called the six o'clock uh, swill. And, but basically, when you, have, when you have time limits to drinking, so you say that nobody, must, nobody can drink after this time or, or nobody can drink during this time, then the legislation itself is creating binging. And so you can you can create cultures. Maybe you don't intend to, but but laws which do things like that 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 that, that ban drinking over a certain period of time, or or, or say all drinking must stop at ten o'clock. Then then you're creating uh, a, a binge drinking situation uh, that, that will occur before that cut off time. So so you so what I'm saying is that regulations do influence the way in which cultures are and health education and attitudes and, and uh, stigma and the the way in which we see drugs will, will affect things and that will come through all sorts. But but going back to your, your other point as well, which is that. People, if they have choices, will choose other drugs. You know, I, I, as I say, I've, I, I've, I've, not, I've not used an illicit substance, but I would if it was legal. I, I certainly would, you know, at the minute I, I'm drinking a reasonable amount of, of alcohol and red wine, and that's, that's our drug of choice with, with caffeine. And, uh, but, but really, on some evenings, it would be much nicer to go for a different drug. You know, I think... Uh, from what I understand and what I've, I've learned, I think you know cannabis and ecstasy would be a lot more pleasurable and and sociable to enjoy, and much less damage to my body if a you know if I can get a clean, regular supply, than uh, than alcohol is doing to my body. So, I, I don't think people. I don't see why I would you know the, the people worrying that if we made all drugs available. I don't understand why anybody like me or anybody else, and I'm no different to other people, why I would choose to do something more dangerous and, and more reckless. I, you know, you wouldn't do that. And, and you know, I'd, if I, if I was out for an evening, you know, as a, uh, if I was if I was with a group of students or whatever, and I was in a, a club at night, if everyone was off their heads on alcohol, I'd actually much prefer to be with a group of students off their head with heroin or with uh, benzodiazepines or, or, or with ecstasy or cannabis and with alcohol. Uh, so, so I think the, the range of drugs, if, if legalised, people would make more sensible choices. And, pe and young people do, you know, I mean, not just young people, people do. But in terms of, of culture, you know, there's a whole scene of people who will go and do acid or go and do a, a bit of coke and ecstasy and cannabis and those club scenes are usually a lot more uh, friendly and less threatening and less sexist and less less abusive than those similar environments where people are just tanked up on alcohol so I, I don't really see a logical argument that making drugs legal would lead to people making reckless decisions or reckless choices. I think people would make ch sensible choices, you know, I mean, there will be a minority that will make some foolish choices, but that minority will, will continue to make foolish choices whether drugs are legal or, or not legal. Uh, but the, the majority of other people who are like the, if, uh, you know, student halls here in New Zealand, like other countries, I suppose, have got a really serious alcohol problem. And, and with that comes a very serious uh, misogyny and, and sexist problem where, where girls, you know, are at risk of being sexually abused and, and in some cases raped. And a lot of that is linked to alcohol and, and linked to the whole culture that goes with it. Well, you know, I wonder what would that be like if uh, if other drugs were, were available and those people were not tanked up on alcohol. The, uh, the last thing I wanted to touch on is for people who are listening, one of the things I often hear from people who are familiar with the drug classroom are they ask, you know, how do I get my my parents or 
my family in general or friends to change their perspective. And it, that would contribute to this sort of bottom up change in getting sort of a, a ground level support for reform. You know, how do you think those conversations can happen? Um, you know, what do you think people should say? What arguments can really be made um, to try and get this to, to spread? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've faced this a lot, you know, lecturing to, you know, 100 or so students at, and uh, some of them have a very fixed view before you begin your lecture and uh, they're going to do a whole 12 weeks on drugs and uh, so it's the same challenge in some ways you, ha you have a, a group of people who are, are so they, they know, I mean basically it, everything they thought they knew is probably a lie really and uh, but how do you do it? I think, I think how you do it is by being considered by being patient by being reasonable uh, and making sure that all that you give them it, 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 and making sure that all their debates that they give you as well, that look, we're, we're going to chat this through, but let's agree from the beginning that both of us will only rely on evidence and information and science and rationality. And... Uh, that's where we'll come from. We'll, we'll sit around the table, but, but I'm going to respect everything you tell me, but we're going to grapple with this, but we can't, we can't lean on I know somebody who, or, or my friend told me that, or I don't think, I don't believe this. We need to look at what the evidence is. And I think with time, a lot of people do come round and they do, if you show them the evidence and, uh, and you engage them with logic, a lot of people do come round. I mean, some people don't because I think it is sort of, sometimes it is some that trying to persuade a, a racist not to be racist, you know, it's, or, or somebody who's sexist not to be sexist. It, it's, it, it, it's not simply a question of, give them the information and then they go home uh, and the next day they come back and they say, oh, I'm no longer a racist. It, you know, you don't unravel people as easily as that. And I suppose in some ways that's why a 12-week course in lecturing is quite useful because people have got time to ponder and they're being hit with the, with the challenge on a regular basis, but in a way that's gentle and persuasive, but evidence-based and, and respectful and, and reasonable. And I think the other thing to, to add to that would be to give them some case studies uh, which try, because I think it's also, because we're dealing with prejudice and, and ideology and misinformation, I think it's worth trying to find ways of using story and analogy. And, you know, so I, I'll say things like, uh, you know, harm reduction now so you're colluding with with drug use to and I'll, and I'll say things well you know should people who go out in kayaks in in new zealand or you know should should they be allowed to have life jackets are we encouraging people to be more dangerous in the way that they go out at sea on their own you know should should people have seat belts are we encouraging people to speed and drive recklessly and and so it's trying to find ways of connecting with some of these arguments that they're holding, which would be, in that example, don't give people harm reduction because you're actually making it easier for them to take drugs and they're likely to, to, to be more reckless. Well, that's not the logic we use with other behaviours. You know, we, we, in, in the mountains here in New Zealand, you know, people go skiing or whatever and, you know, we have helicopters to, we, we, you know, when I went skiing, uh, a couple of years ago, there's actually a helicopter on the ski slope itself with with, with uh, facilities to do some uh, bandaging and, and fix a few, you know, put a few plasters on or whatever, put put broke, breakages into plaster or whatever. But you know, if you if that was drugs, you'd be saying, well, that's encouraging people to ski dangerously and to take more risks. Skiing is a really dangerous activity. People get, get killed, they lose their life. You shouldn't have the helicopter there. You shouldn't be doing that. Well, by using those sort of analogies, you can see the... Sometimes you can unlock some of the prejudices with people. So it's about rationality, but it's also about sometimes some uh, taking them out of that place into a different place which they can relate to, which they're more familiar with. But it's a hard one because I think we are dealing with... We are dealing with... 
with ideology and uh, we're, it's, it, we're dealing with something similar to racism and sexism and those things are not changed simply by information. It's, it takes years, really. Yeah, it does seem as though the recurring problem is the is the elevation of, of drugs as a special activity where I, I've made a lot of the same arguments as you were just laying out and often it does work and then occasionally you have the people who will just scoff at the idea that you can even compare a non-drug activity to a drug activity but if you really try to break that down and analyze how they got to that position it's really just from you know they never considered that prohibition or that prohibition was a bad policy or that drugs could be safe so it just seemed like a absurd position to have which sometimes you can get people to change their views but there are these very ingrained positions that are hard to have a rational discussion about because it often is just anecdote that people rely on or a news story about some drug user did some certain thing and never are people really going to the data because there aren't really any any good papers that would talk about the benefits of the current policy. Uh, there really just aren't. The entire, from the 1960s onward, there have been the scientific or public policy literature that pretty consistently supports a different policy. So clearly it's not ever coming from a, a rational point of view. Mm -hmm. um, but it is true, and, and luckily it is the case, that if you have that kind of rational discussion, a good portion of people will realize, you know, this isn't about enabling or encouraging. It's about just, you know, recognizing, answering a simple, simple question like, how does heroin kill somebody? You know, this is supposedly the most dangerous drug, um, according to many people, but how does it kill people? And often you won't even, you'll see people don't even know how. And if you break it down, it suddenly becomes clear, oh, wow, there are four or five steps that you could use to pretty much prevent all of those harms. And it's this revelation for people and which is, you know, at least encouraging that some people are open to that that kind of perspective yeah yeah and those people who say oh but that's a that's a, a different activity but drugs are different i think again you then lock into well hang on why are drugs different and they then believe some notion that drugs somehow take over the brain or whatever but then you then enter into an argument well why do these how or why can these illicit drugs take over the brain and how come you're not applying that to say alcohol do you, do you drink alcohol do you drink do you drink caffeine or whatever well how doesn't that hijack the brain or whatever so yeah but 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 it is hard yeah to uh to wrap up is there anything you want people to be directed to any social media profiles or any other information that you would uh, like people to see uh no, I think I mean I think people can people can uh, can check out on social media all sorts of stuff. It's just I think I just encourage people, you know I, I don't know who who's listening and and where they're from, but I think anything that you're not sure about, I would really encourage you to go and find out anything you heard in any of uh, of the previous podcasts or anything. If it doesn't make sense, go and make inquiries and find out because. The truth is there, and I think the position that, that you and I have held today is an entirely rational and science-based, evidence-based position. And so anything we've said that doesn't hang true or hold together, I think, you know, push hard and, and keep pushing and uh, keep questioning. And, and I think you'll find that uh, there is evidence there to, to back up and to support stuff. I mean, my, I've got my website, so there's a lot of stuff on my website of videos I've done of, uh, of podcasts, of articles, uh, most of them are available to download. So if anybody's interested in, in some of those arguments, it's uh, my website is https colon forward slash forward slash Julian Buchanan, all one word, uh, J-U-L-I-A-N-B-U-C-H-A-N-A-N dot wordpress dot com. So it's uh, JulianBuchanan.wordpress.com. So if people want more info on, on what I've written or said, uh, that's there. If they want to contact me, I'd be happy to to answer and debate any of these issues because for me this is about. Uh, I, I think I think that the prohibition will go down in history as one of the greatest atrocities in our human history uh, in the last three or four centuries. The harm it's done to countries, which our well, conversation we began on, but the harm it's done to to uh, families and communities as well is it is it's appalling. So so for me, this has been uh, 
uh, a commitment towards social justice, towards uh, improving uh, the, and trying to bring about social change, really, because this is devastating. So, so I'm passionate about people pursuing the truth and, and, and trying to bring an end to this regime because it's it's caused so much damage. But I thank thank yeah thank you Seth for the for the opportunity for for chatting and it's been a uh, pleasurable and enjoyable conversation. Of course, it was great having you on and I will link um, your website or Twitter or anything else in the description so people can find it and thank you for coming on. You're welcome. Take care Seth.